This is the story of a high school teacher from New Hampshire who was chosen to be the very first private citizen in history to fly in space. Oh, my God. <laughs> Two minutes. This is also the story of thousands of America's children, children who already realize that their future is bound up with the future of space exploration. Jesus, I'm so nervous. Let's begin with the teacher's story. Her name is Krista McAuliffe. Last October, as part of her pre-flight training, she was at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida to witness her first shuttle launch. Four, three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of Challenger and the Space Lab D-1 mission. And the shuttle has cleared the tower. It, it was just absolutely wonderful. It's such a fantastic experience that it's still a, a step away from reality for me. I don't think until I'm crossing over the bridge in my flight suit that it's really going to hit home that I'm actually going on the shuttle. Krista McAuliffe is actually going on the shuttle. She will be aboard the Challenger on its next mission, 51L. At that moment, she will become the world's first opening ambassador from a classroom, the nation's premier teacher in space. the private citizen in space was heralded in August 1984 by President Reagan. Today I'm directing NASA to begin a search in all of our elementary and secondary schools and to choose as the first citizen passenger in the history of our space program, one of America's finest, a teacher. The call went out, and over 10,000 qualified teachers sent in their applications. Among them was a social studies teacher from a high school in Concord, New Hampshire, who saw this as an opportunity to connect her abilities as an educator with her interest in history and space. I went for something that I felt I had really no chance in. I, I decided to overextend a bit and, and fill in an application that I knew thousands and thousands of people were going to be filling in. But it was important for me because it was something that I really wanted to do. And I, I hope that a lot of students looking at that will say, well, I know 80 people are going to try out for this team, but it's something that I really want to do and not to be afraid of failure. Krista made the first cut all the way down to 114. Then, early last July, the 10 finalists were drawn. They all spent two intense weeks at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, showing medically fit they were, demonstrating that they had the right stuff, even flying weightless. On July 19th, the suspense was finally dissolved with an announcement by Vice President Bush. First, the backup candidate was selected, Barbara Morgan, an elementary school teacher from McCall, Idaho. You know, I, was, I think I was like eight years old when they shot the first chimpanzee up, and I thought, why a chimpanzee? It ought to be a kid. And the winner, the teacher who will be going into space, Krista McAuliffe. Where is, is that you? <laughs> It's, it's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words. I know my students wouldn't think so. I've made nine wonderful friends over the last two weeks. And when that shuttle goes, they might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be ten souls that I'm taking with me. Thank you. That's great. What gift did Krista McAuliffe have that made her shine just a bit brighter than all the others? We were looking, okay, for a communicator. Our number one criteria would... And Bradley knows she was in charge of the whole selection process for NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Was how well that person would represent teachers. How well, how important it was for that person to influence other teachers rather than what a wonderful time it was going to be to fly on the space shuttle and what they were going to do when they got up there. She's a very bright woman. Um, I think you would um, like her if you just met her um, and sat across the table from her at dinner table. And uh, very sincere, um, down to earth. Uh, and I believe everything that she says. In other words, I believe that she wants to have an impact on education. A 
question comes to mind. Why is NASA interested in influencing teachers, in having an impact on education? Why is America planning to rocket a teacher above the atmosphere for six days and nights? Until now, NASA had always been crystal clear about the reasons for its projects, making sure the Soviets would not be the dominant force in space, sending a man to the moon as a symbol of America's spirit and a step towards even grander explorations, looking at other planets to learn their nature and how we might might exploit them, but why send a teacher into space? To answer that question, we first have to peer into the future of space exploration to learn why America intends to continue her heavenward missions. We finally discovered uh, through oil shortages and things like that, we live a very fragile existence on the Earth, and there are only limited resources here. Commander Dick Scobie will lead Chris decision. If you get down to the point where the resources are no longer available to you to go into space, you're still using them up. Sooner or later, they're all going to be gone. And the only way to, to get around that kind of thing is to migrate into space and to make other resources available to you. So in that sense, it's our survival. According to Dick Scobie and others, our very survival depends on exploiting space. We are using up the Earth's resources, but out in space, limitless energy and materials lie waiting to be tapped. Space can soon become a vast new world to be mined and harvested, colonized and developed. But opening up this frontier means we'll need huge numbers of trained people. That's where a teacher in space becomes crucial. A teacher can inspire other teachers to train a whole generation of children for space careers. The space age is here. And what a lot of kids don't realize is that if they don't get maybe the math science or the, the uh, background or the writing skills or the communication skills, they're going to be out of a job. My emphasis is going to be, look what's out there. This is your world. I mean, let's get prepared for it and to get teachers excited about that future. So the story of the teacher in space really began with the fight for survival, a deep need to reach farther out into space to solve the Earth's problems. And the teacher was created to be a kind of Pied Piper for America's children, recruiting them for the space professions. Well, I find space is very interesting. It's so unimaginable to believe that this place, that the universe is an infinite place, but the by exploration, it, exploration of it begins to unlock new doors. <laughs> On September the 2nd, 1948, Ed and Grace Corrigan became the proud parents of an 8-pound, 13-ounce baby girl, their firstborn. She was named Sharon Krista. It was in this neighborhood, in this house, in Framingham, Massachusetts, that Krista spent most of her childhood. She was talking a blue streak when she was about a year and a half. And Krista was chosen the queen of the playground, yeah, so <laughs> that's she where she started to be singled out a little bit. Yeah. Krista felt she was not much different than other children. Fairly average child. I, I liked to get involved in things. I was always involved in my church, and I was involved in scouts, and I liked to... I played the piano, and I, you know, took dancing lessons, and did all the probably normal things that kids usually do. I was the oldest of five children, so I probably was given a lot more responsibility at a young age. Being the oldest, too, she ended up taking care of the children a lot of times, and she really did a lot for them. She had, took them every place, used to buy them things and play with them, the special games and all that, and she really was very good with the children. She was wonderful with the kids. I don't think anyone, uh, the other children, care that Krista has gone way past them as far as her success is concerned. They're all success successful in their own way, and they're all very special. <laughs> They were all special, but Krista, being the oldest, held a unique place in her father's heart. Krista and I have always been very close, and since Krista was so special, we have a very special tie between father and daughter. Krista was a polite, nice child and at home, a very loving child. 
Krista was more than loving and polite. She was a small town girl who was wiser than most girls her age. She knew exactly what she wanted. She was a good student. She was on the National Honor Society. Well, she worked hard for it. It wasn't, as I say, uh, you know, a snap for her. She was good on the stage. She could sing. She liked to draw and paint and all. And we thought maybe she should further go into that type of a career, but she felt that it was a little too iffy. Could she have known that one day she would have dinner with the president in the White House? She was... Uh very considerate in a way that she knew that we had far more children coming at the line that were going to school. And Krista said, why don't you save your money for the boys and I'll go to Framingham State, which is local. She said, I'll get all the education I need from there. Krista entered into a commitment to teach history to children. When I was growing up, I was really caught up with this, everybody should kind of do for others. And it might have been my family or, you know, the, the atmosphere at the time. But because of that and going into a service occupation, I just felt really good when I was able to contribute something. And teaching was something I felt really good about, and I loved history. I think I'll always be involved in education. I'll, I'm sure I'll be anxious to get back in the classroom in 86. In 1962, Krista had met Stephen McAuliffe. They fell in love and became high school sweethearts. They married on August the 3rd, 1970. They have known each other for about a quarter of a century. I've known Krista since we were sophomores in high school. We started dating when we were, when we were 15. We tried to get her to go with other boys. And I mean, she enjoyed going out, but it wasn't that same thing. And so she and Steve really, they just felt that that's what it was going to be. And it was, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> Krista and Steve now live in Concord, New Hampshire, where they are Democrats. Concord is where they are bringing up their two children, Caroline Six and Scott Nine, where Stephen McAuliffe practices law, where Krista teaches social studies, and where Krista McAuliffe's dream came true. Well, Steve, very sad little girl. On Sunday, September 8th, Krista had a preservation on the last flight that would get her to Houston for the start of her training, because she wanted to spend as much time as possible with her family. She was very upset and probably would have cried all night. Yeah. yeah. It was a quiet late summer day in Concord, New Hampshire. No parades, no crowds, only two news cameras on the front lawn. Ma'am, Love you. An hour and a half drive to Boston gave Krista and her husband Steve their last semi-private moments together. Even at Logan Airport, there was hardly any commotion. <laughs> Krista's plane was delayed and she almost missed her first morning in Houston. But Eastern Airlines knew they had the space teacher on board, a real aerospace celebrity. So they radioed ahead and held the connecting flight. It was long after midnight before she reached her destination. Monday morning, Krista and Barbara Morgan arrived at Johnson Space Center, and they were greeted by a wall of cameras and lights. Hey, if you're used to working with small children, you shouldn't have any trouble with us, so... I'm used to working with 11th and 12th graders, but you're right. <laughs> that was a major fact of life during the first week of training. NASA was inviting the press in for photo opportunities once or twice a day. So the print journalists and photographers and TV crews stationed themselves only inches away from the action. They looked at every move, every remark, as material for their dispatches. Krista was no longer a private citizen. Excuse me, I'm going to duck into the lake for a minute. No one came with me. NASA training is nothing if not methodical. There's a standardized procedure for everything, including listing menu preferences for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in orbit. You know, it, it, was, it was different. Um, I normally don't eat in front of cameras. I think I probably would have been a lot more relaxed you know, <laughs> if I didn't have 20 people in front of me asking me questions or, you know, trying to find out um, how, my re how I reacted to different foods. 
This is for all the Texans in the crowd. As the official backup for Krista, Barbara Morgan went through training side by side with her. But from day one, it was clear that when Krista would finally saw free from gravity, Barbara would remain solidly on the earth. Even though Barbara was a runner-up in a field of 10,000, now there was room for only one real celebrity. We just work together as a team, and, and while Krista's up on the, on the shuttle, I'm going to be running a program called Mission Watch. I'll be letting people know what we did during our training, giving more background information, and then letting, letting people know what's going on during the mission on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm really excited about that. Um, we're, we're a team. <laughs> What do you think about your mother going up into space? I think it's awesome. <laughs> well, we miss her terribly, obviously. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's a very different house without her. Okay, let's get dinner ready. Yeah. Okay. Miss Rosen Cook. While Krista McAuliffe is accomplishing one mission, Stephen McAuliffe is working on a special mission of his own. He is both mother and father to their children, Caroline and Scott. If you've seen the movie Mr. Mom, it's, uh, I, haven't, I haven't found any differences. It's, it's, it's surprisingly like that movie. The thing I hate doing the most is um, in the morning trying to determine what clothes, what goes with what. Show your sneakers, Caroline. <laughs> so we have a fight every morning about those sneakers and whether they go with dresses or not. I usually side with they don't. And I usually lose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, it is absolutely not. Look at this camera and say it's really turkey. Don't worry, Mom. Don't worry, Mom. Okay, girl. Stephen is thrilled that Krista will be the first teacher into space. He also realizes that she will soon be home, and he hopes that once she returns to Earth, that life at the McAuliffe home will be back to normal. That's good. My worst nightmare is that, that when she comes back, I'll be... Uh, my mind will be forever altered and I'll be automatically doing all these chores that I've successfully avoided for 15 years. White House, an organization was launched to help young people cope with the demands of the space age. Just as our past achievements in space reassure us of our greatness, the Young Astronauts Program reassures us that we will keep dreaming new dreams and keep moving forward. President Reagan announced the creation of the Young Astronauts Council, and a movement was sparked that spread from coast to coast with lightning speed. In less than a year, thousands of chapters were established involving hundreds of thousands of children. These foods down here have been freeze-dried to make it possible for them to go into space for astronauts to eat. I got involved in the Young Astronauts because I'm pretty interested in math and science, and they can't really teach you enough in the schools because there's limited information about space. The Young Astronaut Council says that only 6% of America's high school graduates are skilled in math and science. But in Japan, Germany, and the Soviet Union, up to 90% are. We have a lot of catching up to do. All the books like, are old. They're really old, so like, that's why I got, so I got into the Young Astronaut, so I can have new information. I really wanted to be a Young Astronaut because I was very good in math and I wanted to learn more about math so I could be smart when I grew up. The young astronauts sponsor a whole spectrum of activities, all designed to inspire the younger generation. I am interested and I do want to go up in space, so any chance I get, I'll take it. Well, I just stopped in to say happy first anniversary. At the Young Astronauts' the first anniversary, anniversary celebration, a special guest dropped by to give the kids an the extra measure program. of inspiration. And I'm pleased that you're still at it, and we're going to keep it going here. And thank you all for what you're doing. Some of these children may one day build a city on the moon. They may begin the settlement of Mars, even explore the solar system's outer reaches. Yeah, I could 
just picture myself going up to the moon and living on it and things like that. I can imagine that being in the 21st century. It has been five years since America's first shuttle embarked on a journey into space. Since that time, space has become an arena of immense interest for many, even children. Early exploration has triggered the minds and imagination of young people today. They, too, want to know how man can survive in the heavens. Well, as you can see, there are three different CRT, castle ray tools. What exactly is this right here? This is when you're wanting to close in on a satellite and move over. These are students from the Paul Revere High School in Houston, Texas. They are also members of the Young Astronauts Council. Here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston with Jack Waite, these students are getting as close as possible to the real thing, the space shuttle. They hang on the ceiling and floating around. You've seen pictures of them probably eating up, you know, like that. There's Velcro on everything. In April 1985, Rhea Seddon was an astronaut on the space shuttle Discovery. The goal was to launch two satellites. One of the satellites had a malfunction. Rhea and the other crew members then conducted a spacewalk in order to correct the malfunction. The students from the Paul Revere High School learn about the astronauts' experience through Rhea. We uh, made some fly swatter type devices from plastic book covers and some uh, metal tubing we had on board. Uh, we got close to the malfunctioning satellite and tried to flip a switch on the side. It was an interesting mission uh, because we had never done an unplanned spacewalk before. Did your medical experiments help the medical field? One of the major medical experiments that I performed was an echocardiograph experiment, and that is using sound waves to look at the human heart. And for the first time, in space, we were able to safely look inside the human body. Did you feel closer to God when you were up there? It's such a moving experience that, that each person has to interpret it in their own way and try and understand what it is they want to do with this experience in the future. The students now have the opportunity to study aerospace, an elective course which gives them a sense of history. Here they discuss the early flights of Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart. How long do you think it takes the astronauts to fly over that, that same route that these early pilots flew over? Roy? A few minutes, I guess. A few minutes, probably so. If it takes them nine minutes to go around the whole Earth, it probably takes only 15 or 20 minutes to fly across the whole Atlantic Ocean that it took Charles Lindbergh 30 some hours to cross. These forerunners that we had in the 1920s and the 1930s set the pace for our astronauts today. How do these planes differ from the ones that uh, Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart flew? The old airplanes that they flew were not that fast. Maybe a, a couple hundred miles an hour they might fly at tops. You look at this jet right here. This is one of the newest types of fighter and attack aircraft. This is called a Harrier jet. A jet like this actually doesn't even need a runway. A chapter of the Young Astronauts Council from St. Elizabeth's School in San Francisco tours the Ames Research Center. Nicole Kebb, a seventh grader, has a specific goal in mind. She plans to become an astronomer. Because I like to, the stars and I like to see them and I like Halley's Comet. I, I'll go into space because I would like to see if there's any other civilization on other planets. If they said a kid, I, I would go, but I wouldn't be scared. Nicole is eager to learn and understand the groundwork that will prepare young astronauts for space. Hey, Nicole, th being that you're interested in astronomy, it's going to be pretty soon that we're going to be sending up people on the space shuttle. In fact, we're already setting up private citizens. We're going to send up this first school teacher, and it's going to be a lot easier for people to get into space. It's going to be a lot more routine. So by the time you're starting your professional career, it's going to be a lot easier to get up into space and do astronomy studies from up there. 
opportunities to visit places like the Johnson Space Center in Houston and the Ames Research Center in San Francisco encourage the children of today to become part of the world of tomorrow, a world in which the excitement of the space program will bring adventure to their lives. Of course, some parts of the space program aren't adventures, they're just old-fashioned hard work. And I'll go like that, and, and that should make it move away. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to do that right here. And all through her training, Krista has been preparing to teach two lessons. They will be broadcast live from the shuttle the day before landing, and they will be beamed to schools all across the nation. Her first lesson is called the ultimate field trip. Everybody wants to know what it's like to live on board the shuttle. How do you compensate for a weightless environment? Um, you know, how, how does the food have to be different? How does the, the, how does the toilet have to be different? And the second lesson, why we are in space, um, is important because when I was first selected and talking to a lot of people, they didn't understand what on earth went on in the shuttle. It's hard to stay away from excitement for too long. Most teachers don't get to prepare their lessons by flying weightless over the Gulf of Mexico. This is an electromagnet that I am going to take on board the shuttle and we're trying to see if the pattern is going to... Oh, it's so much fun. Everyone would love it. <laughs> you just float, you feel great. And the pattern did work, so we know that that's going to work on board the shuttle. When all is said and done, the teacher in space is still a teacher. During her year with NASA, Krista's salary remains the same as at Concord High School, just under 27000 with a bonus for extra day's work. And like any dedicated teacher, she's keeping a diary of her experiences, not just for fun, but because she knows she's becoming a part of American history. to deal with the future. Kids love to be able to imagine what's going to happen and maybe they need to look a little bit upward and outward and, and look at the possibilities of the future. It's nice to have kids dreaming and, and looking at something that's maybe not within their own scope. How, how many trips to the moon did we make? Six. Six. And that means how many astronauts? Wow. America? Twelve. These young astronauts from Baltimore are taking a tour of the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. Let's go over here and see this. Now here is the whole thing all put together. Now that Their volunteer guide is Welsh Pogue, a retired attorney. The exhaust from the shuttle, is it clean or dirty? The exhaust from the brown tank, the big one filled with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, is clean. Nothing comes out of there but water and vapor. Through young astronaut activities, these students are gaining valuable insights about space exploration, insights that will shape their own ambitions. Well, I would like to go up and learn about space and go up in a spaceship and maybe plan a future space colony. I would make it so it would be like Earth, but in space, so there it wouldn't be as crowded on Earth because the population is multiplying every day. This museum reverberates with history, not only of space exploits, but of all the aeronautical adventures which preceded them. I learned how Bloomberg had to stay awake for such a long time, who gave him money for the flight, and how lonely he must have been over on the flight. The history of space flight goes back scarcely 30 years, but in those few years, we've accomplished miracles. We have walked on the moon, we've lived and worked in space for long periods of time, and we've sent probes to distant planets, now with a space shuttle flying more than once a month. We're making space flight almost ordinary. Alan Shepard was the first American to journey into space. Later, he went to the moon. He feels the billions spent on space exploration have been well worth it. Well, let me tell you something. Not a single dollar went to the moon. It all stayed right here. It was money spent in developing mines and computers and navigation schemes and techniques which make our life that much easier today. 
probably take about uh, NASA's two price hours tag is about one percent of the federal budget. For that money, not only does America get the most sophisticated space exploration in the world, we also get spin-offs from the space program which benefit life down here on Earth. Roger. Space research has brought us advances in medicine, better computers, image processing, space age building materials, solar energy systems, help for the handicapped, even cooler sportswear. Much better from this perspective. Our space program has brought some other benefits that are less tangible, like opportunities for women and for minorities to become astronauts. NASA is always trying to get uh, minorities into the program, and uh, right now we have four black astronauts in the program, and uh, we're hoping to find a uh, black woman to come into the program and eventually fly in space, and I sort of anticipate that will come about. But space research and its benefits won't continue unless America stays strong in technology and in education. That's why teachers and the Teacher in Space program are so important. For the first time, nationally, teachers as a whole group have been recognized as good communicators and, and people are looking at us in a very positive light. I do hope that, you know, we'll shed some light on some of the problems the schools are having. For example, my own elementary school, we have $200 for all science equipment for the entire elementary school of 580 students. That, that doesn't, um, you know, <laughs> doesn't quite cut the mustard when you're trying to do a, a real student-involved science program, you know, doing more than just turning the book to page 55 and reading. Okay, I want you to think about that yourself. I want you to if you can get teachers feeling good about themselves, if, if the program did nothing else, I mean, education would be growing by leaps and bounds during this year. And teachers are just really excited about it. Says, pass the payload's comet. Okay. How many of you have been looking for Halley's comet in the sky? Audrey Williams, a graduate student from Pittsburgh, is concerned with technology and education. She emphasizes the importance of science to a group of students while in the planetarium at the Buell Science Center. Can everybody see those lenses in there? Mm -hmm. I look very close. Yeah. Well, I think it'd be interesting to see what it's like on the moon and how it's like to go around and do ex like experiments. I like to work with science technology, especially computers. The children embrace the space program seriously. These young astronomers not only believe that it will be possible to live in space, but that it might be necessary. Well, if there's a nuclear war, it might be necessary to find other inhabitable planets because um, of the effects of radiation is going to ruin life as we know it on this planet, so it would be inevitable to live somewhere else. Most of you have heard about the North Star, right? If these children are in fact contemplating life in space, Audrey Williams will inspire them. So that you can get a better understanding of how when you come to see the planetarium shows, just what's going on, okay? You... She will make certain they learn about and understand the heavenly bodies that make up our universe. America has always been greatest when we dared to be great. We can reach for greatness again. We can follow our dreams to distant stars, living and working in space for peaceful economic and scientific gain. Tonight, I am team NASA to develop a permanently manned space station and to do it within a decade. A permanent space station is no longer a fiction writer's dream. It is already developing and growing and becoming a reality inside aerospace computers. By the early 1990s, it will be orbiting 300 nautical miles above us. Last November, on Shuttle Mission 61B, astronauts Jerry Ross and Charles Walker practiced putting together elements for a space station. We've never done construction work outside gravity. We're just learning how to do it. What does the future in space hold for us? Where will our ambitions take us? First, they will take our vision and our understanding much deeper into the universe. This fall, we will release a super high-tech space telescope into orbit that will peer 50 times farther from our home planet than we have ever seen before. Beyond these wonders lies the certainty that America will build large space colonies with whole cities floating freely or anchored on the moon and other planets. 
These will not be way stations. People will live their entire lives on these new worlds. I think you can survive on uh, the moon and Mars. That's a logical progression of the space program, the way it's going from shuttle, which is a truck to get into orbit, to space station, which gives us a jumping off place, to colonization, which is probably the next logical step. Space colonies and other enterprises will mean opportunities for the next generation. So they're planning to produce oxygen by mining on the moon. Well, to kids of today, especially those kids who might be engineer, who might be planning on being engineers, that's something that they can be thinking about. Because right now, nobody really knows how to mine on the moon and get oxygen. Already, countless thousands of workers earn their living from space. Barb and I were trying to figure out if everybody who's involved in the project were around here, there'd be you know, tens of thousands of people. You know, for one launch, it'd be a whole really exciting. <laughs> Ultimately, what lies ahead in the future is a mystery. Technology may be noble, but the human mind and heart are full of secrets. One of the great unknowns is whether space exploration will bring us peace or war. Star Wars, the strategic defense initiative, is on the drawing boards of the 1980s. Who knows what will be on the drawing boards 50 years from now? There's a, a myth that there's some sinister, evil, new project underway that uh, that the... Uh, that there's this program to militarize space. But in fact, we have used space for good and legitimate purposes since the inception. It's really the people themselves through their Congress and through the administration that make the decisions as to how much of our, of our technology should be used for military purposes. Krista McAuliffe believes looking at the Earth as a whole may help nations see beyond their differences. Looking at the world as, as a unit um, the people, I'm sure, who went to the moon because they were able to see the whole world as this globe came back with a much better perspective of why we all should work together. Because we are pretty fragile when you look at the whole universe. Um, so maybe as more and more people get out and get that perspective, things are going to change. Ever since movies were invented, film directors have enjoyed fantasizing about unearthly adventures, but now the line between science fiction and science fact is becoming blurred. Back on it. Action! Space Camp is a feature film in production right now. The plot takes some kids on a tour of the space shuttle where it unexpectedly blasts off. There, and then do it just like the big time. Here we go. Space camp is fiction. There's no way the shuttle could lift off by accident. But the shuttle is a reality, and living without gravity is a reality, and even space camp is a reality. Roger, main, we have main ignition. Three, two, we are go for SRB ignition. Ignition, we have SRB ignition. Clearing the pad, lift off. It's a place in Huntsville, Alabama where girls and boys can spend a few days getting as close to the experience of space travel as you can get without accidentally taking off. I've learned a lot more this week, this whole week, than I've learned reading about space and the shuttle and all of these missions. I really want to learn about space, and I want to know what the future is for us in space. I would like to be an astronaut and go up. I would go on a rock to, to go up to Mars. Untangle that carefully. The young astronauts from the St. Barnabas School in Philadelphia have found a less elaborate way to explore space. <laughs> With sister Marie Diane, they will launch a rocket that they designed. This exercise will ignite their imagination and heighten their technical skills. The thing that I like about space is not so much outer space, but the implications for inner space. I like all the things that they have learned in space that help us on Earth. I think that going out to space, solving a lot of those difficulties, help us on Earth, solving our own problems like pollution and so on. I Once the excitement is sparked, I think it just explodes to the whole world. It's fantastic. I'm 
delighted to be here um, representing the teaching profession and most of all representing you from Concord, New Hampshire. It is New Year's in Concord, New Hampshire, a town that is over 200 years old. Concord is reveling in the glory of one of its own who has become a herald. It is almost as if the town of Concord, too, will orbit the earth. It's very important, especially to a town like Concord that's kind of a sleepy town, even though it's the state capital. Well, she's the first teacher in space. The first teacher and also a woman, thank goodness. I want to be an astronaut because of Kristen McCullough. It's going to be a, a big experience for our class. The thrill is everywhere. The third grade at the Kimball Elementary School, a chapter of young astronauts, is part of the enthusiasm. Scott McAuliffe and his classmates are gearing up to watch Krista head for space in the Challenger. The space program captures the passion that young kids have about their world. The idea of blasting off from this Earth and exploring the universe is something that captures the imagination of kids uh, like dinosaurs do, and monsters, and they weave the fantasy into the rocketry. Zachary Freed is Scott McCullough's best friend and classmate. His lifelong fascination has been given an exclamation point because of Krista's adventure. I'm interested in space and a little of the human body. I first started when I was four years old, and I first drew pictures of planets. I would like to be a millionaire when I grow up. I might earn money when I go up in space. Krista McAuliffe's truck has given the town of Concord, and particularly the teaching profession, a sense of pride. Krista's spirit is contagious. The teachers of Concord have acquired a new self-image. I think it will inspire parents. I think it will inspire administrators to look and say, gee, you know, we've got some good people out there, and, and they're proving it now. They've chosen her, and she has shown what a lot of teachers have, and there's a lot of good teachers out there who, with support, uh, can really get through to, to kids and really get them fired up. My Months and weeks of training and waiting have now shrunk to days and hours. The Challenger stands poised on launch pad 39B as mission 51L nears liftoff. We're happy to have Chris on board. I think she's an asset to the crew, and the flight is going to be fun for us, and we want it to be fun for her. We want her to be interested, enjoy it. There are two things that the commander told me to do, and he said the first one, he said, I want you to have fun, and the second one, he said, look out the window. In a sense, the most important part of Krista's mission will begin only after she lands, because then she will crisscross the country for several months and speak to the whole nation about space. Basically, what we're going to be doing is sharing our experiences, explaining some of the things that took place on the shuttle that, that the teachers were involved in, and we're going to have kind of a lecture circuit type of thing that will start probably in March or so and continue until um, school will start next year. When Krista becomes ambassador for NASA, no doubt she will let America in on a secret astronauts have known for years that space is about to become part of everyday life. Not that we're going to go leaping into colonization uh, right away, but I think within 20 years we're going to see ordinary people just going up for, as passengers for the weekend. When the space station gets up there uh, and we have hotels up there, then folks will take off on Friday and go up spend the weekend and come back to work on, on Tuesday. Can you think of somebody being born in space and on a space station living there? Or traveling to another planet or having a colony set up on Mars? <laughs> in autumn, Krista's contract with NASA will end. What will she do then? What will life outside the spotlight be like? <laughs>
that's been my life and I really enjoy teaching and I feel I do a good job and that's a, a good commitment for me. So I, I do plan on being back in the classroom and I feel that the Teacher in Space program would lose an awful lot if the teacher never returned to the classroom. Krista McAuliffe will return to Concord School because she knows her true mission lies with her students and when she comes back from her adventures, she will have more than ever to give them. There's things that, that I see a lot of times in a classroom that just ma makes me want to cry because kids will set such low limits for themselves. You know, kids have to push themselves a little bit more. Um, and and it, I think it makes them feel good. And they don't have to set themselves very realistic bounds sometimes. You know, it, it's not, it's not um, a, a thing that I would, would say to kids, you know, don't dream. You know, well, you're only a C student in English, so you're never going to be a poet. You know, dreaming's okay.